Pa evo, prije nego počnemo na engleskom, samo da nešto kažem na našem jeziku, pošto se razumijemo, barem starije generacije u Sloveniji još uvijek razumije ovaj naš zajednički jezik. Velika mi je čast biti ovdje danas, but I will immediately switch to English, since there are people who don't understand our language. As I said, it's my great honor to be here today at this double anniversary of Günther Anders. Uh, I'll start by, by, by an event which uh, is being recalled by Günther Anders uh, in his uh, uh, text, uh, which is called Die Rede über die Drei Weltkriege, uh, the speech about the three world wars, uh, which was published in 1964, which was originally a speech which he gave at a protest in, in Germany in Mainz. I'll come to that text later, but I think this is a beautiful beginning uh, for, for my speech today. Uh, so Günther Anders recalls an event which happened in 1936 in Paris. Uh, as uh, experts of Günther Anders here among us know very well, this was the year when Günther Anders emigrated to the United States. Uh, he fled from Adolf Hitler as a Jew uh, who might ended up without his head as many others, uh, not just Jews during that time. Uh, and just before he left, uh, he recalls an event uh, uh, in Paris uh, where he was already in exile for, for the last three years, uh, together with Walter Benjamin, later also joined by Hannah Arendt and others. Uh, it was an event at a public hall uh, where Andre Malraux uh, held a speech at a podium, at a desk like this, without a computer and so on. Uh, you know Andre Malraux, the famous writer who would become part of the French resistance, the first information minister under uh, Charles de Gaulle, later also a famous minister of culture. Uh, so it's 1936, Andre Malraux is completely nervous, dissatisfied uh, that the French intelligentsia at that time, let me remind you 1936, so it's not 1932, 33 or whatever, that the French intelligentsia in 1936 uh, doesn't take Adolf Hitler seriously. Uh, so the room is uh, 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 not really enthusiastic about his speech, uh, and Andre Malraux makes, uh, uh, invents a nice gesture, a nice trick. Uh, he starts like this. Dead. Dead. And he counts every tenth person and says in French, of course, uh, dead. And that was the time when, uh, when he caught the, the, the attention of the audience. Uh, Günther Anders uh, commenting this case uh, says in a very surprised manner, uh, every tenth, you know, he was only counting every tenth person uh, 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 saying that every tenth is already dead or that the death already will have happened. Uh, you know, this famous uh, temporal shift uh, uh, which we will also discuss today. Uh, and Günther Anders says in his beautiful manner, those were the good times when you could count every tenth as someone who is probably dead. These times lie behind us. Today and here, one single gesture would be sufficient. This gesture would embrace all of us, and by this I don't mean only you, you who are here in this room today, uh, and not only those on the streets, and as we heard from Christian Dries, the streets activism, political activism was very important uh, uh, for Günther Anders, or those from other countries and other cities. This gesture would rather embrace the whole of today's and tomorrow's humanity. And the word dead, you would need to say it only once. So instead of like André Malraux going counting every 10th person in the room, uh, according to Günther Anders in 1964 already, it would be sufficient to just come and say dead which would mean that everyone here in this room will have been dead already, or is already dead in a way. Uh, so I wanted to start by this uh, uh, little uh, anecdote uh, uh, before we come to the gist of the matter, and which is, of course, uh, the double anniversary of uh, Günther Anders. Uh, so what I will try to do today is, uh, in a way, to paint his, uh, not curriculum vita, but vite, as he says, uh, he didn't have one biography, but biographies. Uh, try to show the relevance, what I think personally is the relevance, what would be the relevance of such uh, a neglected philosopher as Jean-Pierre Dupuy, the French philosopher says about Günther Anders, the most neglected German philosopher of the 20th century, 
And besides trying to show his relevance, I will also try to show what were the possible answers, responses, strategies which Günther Anders proposed and which might be useful even today. Starting with the double anniversary, of course, it's impossible not to speak about his rich for life. Uh, as you know, Günther Anders was born in 1902, uh, died 30 years ago in Vienna. Uh, when he died in Vienna in 1992, uh, just as Yugoslavia was collapsing and the brutal war started here in this place, uh, uh, luckily not that disastrous as in other places of ex-Yugoslavia, uh, Günther Anders lived enough at the time of his death to witness firsthand collapses of empires, the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for instance, World War I, Spanish flu, although no one at that time knew it was the Spanish flu, of course, the turbulent years of the Weimar Republic, uh, when he fell in love with Hannah Arendt, uh, the rise of Adolf Hitler, Second World War, Auschwitz, Holocaust, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Vietnam, Chernobyl, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of socialist Yugoslavia, the reunification of Germany. I mean, I just tried to sum up some of the major events of the 20th century, uh, which Günther Anders not only experienced firsthand, but actually theorized, and not only theorized, but as we will see, he was rather active in trying not to just understand the situation, but to change it. Uh, Christian Dries before already spoke about uh, the, the, the rising uh, 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 relevance and the rising reception research of Günther Anders, which could be approached in different waves. Uh, I would agree that you know the first wave started late 80s, 90s when he died. Uh, and here, of course, we have to uh, uh, show our gratitude first and foremost to Paul Konrad Liesmann, uh, but also to German scholars uh, uh, and Austrian scholars uh, who did a lot when it comes to the research of, of Günther Anders. Uh, one big event, of course, in, in this research and reception was uh, the founding of the Nachlass uh, in, in Vienna in 2004, uh, where, as we know, there is a, well, not infinite, but a huge reservoir of thoughts, insights, or just notes, uh, which are just waiting to be developed further. Unfortunately, for those who don't speak English, this is all in German. And we'll come to this point a bit later. Uh, then, of course, 2012 was uh, uh, an important year when uh, the Günther Anders, the International Günther Anders Society, uh, was founded in, in Vienna. Uh, and uh, uh, which, which really helped in building a reception of Günther Anders. As Dries said, and I would agree, unfortunately we can see that uh, the reception of Günther Anders is mainly still constrained to the academic world, as we can see today here as well, uh, uh, which is rather unfortunate. Uh, as said, Austrian scholars, German scholars, but we also can thank, as always, as you know, in the 20th century, it was the French scholars uh, B uh, Bachelard, Bataille, and many others who started to reinterpret German philosophers. Something similar happened to Günther Anders. Uh, so thanks to Jean-Pierre Dupuy, Bernard Stiegler, Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, uh, we have heard about a pos possible, uh, uh, possible ways to apply Günther Anders' philosophy to our contemporary moment. Most recently in Italy, uh, Franco Berardi Bifo uh, uh, and, and others. But it's still not enough. Uh, speaking about the relevance of Günther Anders, I will just sketch uh, uh, a few thoughts uh, why I think he's so relevant today. Uh, and then we will jump into his vitae, into his biographies, and through the biographies uh, uh, try to understand uh, uh, how he actually coined some of his most important terms. Uh, so to cut a long story short, uh, uh, and not to jump around, I would say that uh, uh, Günther Anders remains one of the most relevant philosophers, not, not of the 20th century, but of the 21st century, first and foremost, but not only uh, because of his philosophy of technology, of course, uh, uh, which has to be read uh, uh, in a sort of contrast with the Heideggerian philosophy uh, 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 of technology, of course although there are some, some similarities. Uh, so his philosophy of technology, of course, was uh, the main breakthrough, uh, uh, the outdatedness of human beings, first volume, second volume, uh, the term of the Promethean 
discrepancy or the Promethean gap, uh, 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 our inability to imagine what are the consequences of our technological abilities, you know, what we are able to produce technologically and how we are able to change the world. You know, Günther Anders was speaking about that much before the rather popular term of Anthropocene, uh, uh, and in which way this is actually leading uh, to the, I wouldn't say self-destruction, because we are not just destroying ourselves, but destruction of planet Earth. And not just planet Earth, but temporality in a way. Uh, the other term why I think he is still relevant today, more relevant than ever, is of course Apocalypse Blindheit, uh, his term uh, which describes a certain blindness towards the apocalypse, uh, uh, which of course today, if you look at it, uh, you know, two years after, pan after the pandemic, I don't see anyone with a mask here in the room. I'm not moralizing. I'm just saying that, you know, people are quickly even forgot uh, uh, about this pandemic which was, uh, uh, you know, making waves around the world and which didn't end yet. Uh, now we have a war, climate crisis is here. I mean, we have not just one war, but many wars. Uh, and every day we can actually see uh, that uh, many people and the majority of the world population is actually drowning into a sort of apocalypse blindheit. And it's not the majority of the people to blame, but it is our political leaders to blame. Uh, then comes the term of the supraliminal, uh, which I think definitely needs uh, uh, more, uh, 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 more research today, because I think this term, you know, you have uh, popular th theories today which talk about hyper objects and similar stuff. Uh, uh, but Gunther Anders was there already, you know, several decades ago when he said that we are unable to understand and to imagine the scale of our present and future catastrophe. And that instead of speaking about something which is subliminal, you know, the way propaganda, media, advertisements, commercials, and so on work, we have to speak about the supraliminal, something which is beyond our threshold of perception. Mm. So I think this term supraliminal is definitely something which needs to develop, needs to be developed further. Then, of course, uh, which is connected to, the, to his uh, philosophy of technology, it's the nuclear age, of course. Günther Anders was the first, not one of the first, I would say, the first philosopher of the 20th century who understood, who understood the nuclear threat deeply enough and correctly and went to the final logical consequences of the nuclear age. That's the reason, of course, why he was called and still is called the nuclear, nuclear atom philosoph, uh, atom, uh, nuclear philosopher, uh, which of course is a narrow description of his work as I will try to show. Further, of course, there is uh, uh, what remains uh, relevant today is his critique, early critique of consumerism, early critique of uh, uh, new media, which is not new anymore, radio, television. It would be interesting to see Günther Anders in the times of social media, for instance. Uh, the next relevance, and I'm really glad that I don't have the book, I hope I will get it, uh, because I wrote the foreword, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, no, 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 please sit, you don't have to bring it now, later, uh, to take it as a souvenir, because I still understand some Slovenian. Uh, 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 he is also one of the first, if not the first philosophers who talked about spa space exploration. And that's why I'm really glad that in Slovenia, the Institute of Kierkegaard, published now, Poglet z Lune, uh, The View from the Moon, you know, a book which is not translated in English yet. Although if you look at our current stage of space exploration with uh, characters such as Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and so on, uh, you will see that uh, uh, Günther Anders 50 years ago actually predicted that what we, are witness what we would witness in the near future would be the privatization of space, the privatization, privatization of space exploration, which wouldn't be anymore in the hands of states, but would be in the hands of big business, private companies. I mean, that's the situation which we have now, you know, NASA sponsoring Elon Musk or G Jeff Bezos uh, uh, to develop space tourism and then to hunt precious resources, uh, which will uh, uh, not be available on Earth anymore. So we will have to continue suck and extract uh, space itself. So I would say this is one of the fields which, again, needs more research and, and, and needs to be applied to our age today. Unfortunately, in English, there is not much to be found. But fortunately, English, of course, is not the most important language in the world, although we speak English, of course, today. 
Um, another point, uh, another term which, uh, 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 of course, gains more and more relevance today uh, is the term of uh, the apocalypse without kingdom. Uh, recently on EFLUX, uh, this text uh, was uh, published for the first time in English. Uh, and uh, I think it's important because here Günther Anders introduces uh, uh, this term of the naked apocalypse, the naked apocalypse without kingdom. Uh, we are the first to expect not the kingdom of God after the end, but nothing at all. That's what Günther Anders says. And unlike the rather optimistic, and I think this is a very important point today also for political activism, unlike the rather optimistic thesis of the kingdom without apoc apocalypse, kingdom without apocalypse present both in the Judeo-Christian eschatology and secularized versions of revolutionary movements, for Günther Anders there is no happy end. Only the end time, the end zeit. And it cannot be exchanged by another time because we are unable to unlearn what we know. And namely, we are unable to unlearn our capacity not to self-destruct, but to destruct the planet. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, it would be impossible to speak about Günther Anders just as a philosopher. Uh, uh, of course, his, one of his main aims was to pop popularize philosophy. He was never an academic philosopher, uh, 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 neither before nor after his uh, return from the United States. Of course, he had lectures at the universities and so on. Uh, but he was first and foremost uh, something like a Gelegenheit philosopher, but at the, at, at the same time a passionate political activist. Uh, he was a member of the Sartre, Sartre, Russell Sartre Tribunal, uh, uh, a good friend with uh, one of the great Yugoslav partisans and historians, Vladimir Dedier, for instance, who was also part of the Russell Sartre Tribunal. And his network, of course, is much wider. It goes to Simone de Beauvoir, Peter Weiss, many people who were, Tariq Ali, for instance, who is still alive, uh, who were part of the Sartre Russell Tribunal. Uh, at the same time, he was one of the first protagonists of the anti-nuclear movement. Uh, uh, already in the late 50s, and then, of course, in the 60s. Uh, so, not to mention, of course, his anti-war stance. So I would say his political activism is also something from which we can learn today. And then, last but not least, and I'll focus my speech, uh, uh, towards the end of my speech, I'll focus on those questions. Uh, what are the possible strategies, possible answers, possible uh, 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 paths, directions, which Günther Anders provides and which might be helpful to us today? Uh, and I'll develop each of these points, hopefully, further a bit later. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I think that uh, his temporal shift, uh, 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 the point of mourning the future, the point of mourning the end before the end actually arrived. Uh, then, of course, it's his postulate, credo, motto, uh, to widen our sense of time in the sense that what we have to do today is not simply the old old form of internationalism, I would go in the direction to call it transnationalism is what, what we need today, not inter, uh, uh, but to go beyond the nation. Uh, but besides that, Günther Anders is one of the first philosophers and political activists who also says that what we have to do is to widen our sense of time, so not just to go beyond borders in order to unite against a threat which is a universal threat, not just for human species, but also for other species, namely extinction. But we have to understand also to go beyond time itself. The nuclear threat is the best example or nuclear waste repositories, you know, in the sense that radioactivity will stay here for several thousands of years. And that once we are producing this sort of technology, we have to be aware about the future. Or as the Human Inter Interference Task Force, a group of uh, anthropologists, semioticians, architects in the 80s tried to, to do, you know, they were called by the American government to provide possible solutions, how to communicate with someone in 10,000 years, to warn them about what we buried deep inside our soul, the radioactive material. Uh, and these are the kind of questions which Günther Anders uh, posed. Uh, connected to that, I, I would say one of the possible strategies for our today's moment is what Günther Anders uh, called the production strike, uh, the production strike applied to nuclear weapons. But I think having in mind uh, the war which is ongoing uh, in Europe, but not just Europe, let's not forget other wars which are still ongoing, uh, it 
could and should be applied to the arms industry as such. So Gunther Anders' idea was that what we need today uh, is uh, uh, a strike in the production, not just production, transport, production, construction, and operation of, uh, uh, of weapons of mass destruction. And then, of course, last but not least, but I'll come to that at the very end, it's just a teaser, uh, Anders is in insisting that we have to remain infantile. And that might sound uh, a bit surprising, but I think until the end of his life, uh, uh, he insisted that, that we should remain infantile, if you want, childish. So that's just, just a general introduction. Uh, and since we are here gathered to commemorate also the double anniversary, I will start from his vita because I think it's, it's crucial and it's impossible. Anders is one of those philosophers where it's impossible to abstract his life from his theory and from his philosophy. Um, he himself, uh, in an essay, De Amigrant, uh, which is recently uh, republished, which was recently republished in Germany, uh, originally published in 62, said that I don't have a vita, I don't have a curriculum vita, I have only vitae, I only have biographies. Uh, and he says that no life, and especially not his life, and the life of Jews of the 20th century and those who were uh, trying to escape persecution, that this kind of life is never singular, that we can speak about this kind of life only in the plural. Uh, and Günther Anders is the best example of that. Uh, uh, he was born in 92 in Breslau, uh, which was at that time uh, 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 German, but after the Potsdam Conference it became Wroclaw, so now perhaps Günther Anders today could be considered a Polish philosopher. Uh, uh, it just shows how irrelevant nationalities actually are when you try to apply to philosophy. You know, is, Ger is Günther Anders a German philosopher? That would be a good question. You know, why isn't there a bigger reception or why wasn't there a bigger reception of Günther Anders in Germany? Should he be considered an Austrian philosopher? I mean, he lives from 50 until 92. Uh, that's a bit more than half of his life. Uh, in Vienna, in Österreich, is he a... Austrian philosopher. I mean, these kind of questions are, of course, if you ask me, irrelevant. It's a rhetorical question. Philosophy, if it's true philosophy, doesn't have a nation. So he was born in 92 uh, 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 by, and his parents were the famous child psychologist William and Clara Stern. He was born as Günther Stern, Günther Sigmund Stern, uh, 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 and uh, already in his diaries, in her diary, uh, his mother says that Günther Anders, as a child, uh, 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 always showed a desire to be Anders, uh, to be different. Uh, later, of course, there is this anecdote how he actually got uh, uh, this name, uh, but in a way, actually, his surname, uh, self-chosen surname, or in a way anticipated by his mother psychologist, uh, 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 is the best possible description of, of Günther Anders, who definitely was a rather different philosopher of, of the 20th century. Uh, he first started to study at the university in Hamburg, uh, where one of, of his uh, professors was, uh, among others, Ernst Kassirer. Uh, then in uh, 1921, uh, he moves to Freiburg, mm, completes uh, a dissertation under Edmund Husserl, which was directed against Edmund Husserl, uh, but he got uh, uh, a possibility to remain Husserl's secretary, uh, uh, which he rejected, of course. Uh, and then he started to travel around Europe, first works uh, in the Louvre, uh, in the museum in Paris as a guide, later travels to England, uh, and then he returns to Marburg. Here things become interesting. Uh, uh, I think the missing part of this German TV series, Be Babylon Berlin, uh, uh, would, which is about the Weimar years and, you know, the militarization after First War, World War, the rise of Nazism already, but also a lot of drugs, sex, and so on. Uh, uh, I think the missing part of this German, German TV series is the Günther Anders and Hannah Arendt years of the 1920s, you know, uh, because it could fit in perfectly into this kind of uh, uh, scenario. Namely, in Freiburg, in Marburg in 1925, 
uh, at a seminar of Martin Heidegger, which is this, you know, this is a, a very well-known story. Uh, he meets his future wife, Hannah Arendt. In 1929, uh, uh, at a Maskenball, you know, a, a, a ball, or how do you say it in, in English, uh, uh, with masks, uh, he falls in love with Hannah Arendt. That's why I'm saying it really has this kind of uh, flavor of the Weimar years, you know, everything is collaps collapsing, but at the same time, love is happening between two of the most intriguing philosophers of the 20th century. After, of course, Hannah Arendt had an affair with one of the perhaps also intriguing philosopher, but on a bad side, in a way, uh, politically speaking. Uh, in a note from 1984, Günther Anders says, uh, uh, he recalls how he actually uh, succeeded from his male perspective, of course, uh, to, 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 to convince Hannah Arendt, or not to convince her, but for her to fall in love with him. Uh, he says, Gewonnen habe ich Hannah auf dem Ball mit der im Tanzen gemachten Bemerkung, dass Leben derjenige Akt sei, durch das man etwas a posteriorisches den zufällig getroffenen anderen in ein a priori des eigenen Lebens verwandle. Bestätigt hat sich diese schöne Formel freilich nicht. Uh, 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 in, in English, I'll try to translate it. Uh, I succeeded to 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 gewin and to take victory over Hannah uh, at a dance, and during the dance, I made the following uh, uh, following uh, thought: uh, that love is that act through which at something which is a posterior a posteriori uh, uh, a person you meet randomly becomes the a priori of someone's life. And then he adds in his characteristic tone, uh, but this beautiful formula didn't prove to be correct. <laughs> uh, uh, you will find out, I mean, if you have read uh, uh, the, the correspondence between Günther Anders and Hannah Arendt, which was published in German recently, uh, you will find out why. But nonetheless, nevertheless, uh, Günther Anders and Hannah Arendt were rather active, not just philosophically, but politically. Uh, but besides being politically active, in 1930, they write an essay together on the Duino elegies of Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, uh, where for the first time, I think they, they took, at least together, they didn't write together anymore later, speak about the Weltfremdheit des Menschen. Uh, and it's interesting because they write the text in 1930. It was a text, as you know, which uh, Rilke started to write 100 kilometers away from here, near Trieste, at the castle of Duino in 1912. Would publish it later in 1922 uh, 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 in Switzerland. Uh, would finish it in 1992 in Switzerland. In the meantime, what you had, of course, was First World War, Spanish flu, hyperinflation, further militarization leading to the Second World War. Uh, so in 1932 in Berlin, uh, Günther Anders and Hannah Arendt and everyone thinks they are crazy, uh, hold a private seminar on a book which for them was a prophetic book. Uh, the name of the book was Mein Kampf uh, by Adolf Hitler. Uh, Günther Anders would later uh, uh, explain what kind of uh, uh, miss success that was and failure. He said it would have been easier in 1932 uh, to gather people to give a seminar on Hegel. Uh, so that was the state of the German intelligentsia at that time. I'm not saying, of course, Zizek would, com would, would completely disagree with me if I just said that in front of him. I'm not saying people shouldn't deal with Hegel during uh, uh, times of war, uh, but it shows how, in which way, the German intelligentsia at that time was narrow-minded. Uh, George Lukács would, would describe that beautifully in his critique of the Frankfurt School in his Hotel Abgrund, uh, uh, Grand Hotel Abyss, uh, where he describes the German intelligentsia as those people who live in a grand hotel, they have a jazz room, another room, another room, but there here, there is the abyss already waiting. Uh, in 1933, uh, he, after the Reichstag fire, he emigrates to, to Paris, uh, Hannah Arendt would, uh, would come uh, later. And that's the time in 1933 when he would start to write uh, and when he finishes uh, his dystopian, I would say science fiction, but it's not really science fiction novel, anti-fascist novel, uh, Die Molusische Katakombe, The Molusian Catacomb, another work which is not translated into English as far as I know. Uh, 
it would be published only in 1992, the year of his death. These were also the years when Gunther Anders, in a way, starts with his political activism. Uh, much later, uh, uh, in, in an interview, he gave a lot of interviews at the end of his life. There's a book in German also translated, and it contains a lot of uh, interesting ideas. Much later, in an interview in 1985, uh, he would describe the Paris years and his relationship to Walter Benjamin as follows. I'll read it because I think it gives an insight into his early political activism. He says, for me, Benjamin was not part of the Adorno circle, his arch enemy, among others. Uh, he was my second cousin, whom I know, knew since I was one year old. I cannot say that we did philosophy together in Paris. We were first of all anti-fascists, Second to this, we were anti-fascists, and then we were also anti-fascists. I mean, who could say that today among the, left, the, 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 the academic uh, philosophers? Uh, we may also have done some philosophy besides this, but you have a wrong image of our immigration if you believe that we had the time to sit together and speculate. Adorno and Horkheimer may have had the time because they were financially secure. And a similar situation would come true later when he emigrated. So he would emigrate in 1936 from Paris to the United States, ended up in California, in Hollywood, penniless, completely penniless, had to work various odd jobs uh, from assembly lines to, uh, to prop costumes, washing the corpses of history, as he said in his text in, in, in Hollywood. Uh, and the situation was similar, you know, Herbert Marcuse, at, his, at whose house in Santa Monica he crashed and slept because he was penniless at one moment, uh, made a career in the United States, didn't have the same precarious existence. Uh, the Mann brothers, Adorno, Horkheimer, Hannah Arendt, unlike them who turned into permanent exiles, uh, Günther Anders decided to, to return to Europe after 14 years. In Hollywood, I think, the, the Hollywood experience, uh, as strange as that might sound, uh, was very formative for him, but also for his philosophy of technology. Uh, at one point, he, he would say that if I hadn't worked in factories, I would have never been able to write my critique of the technological age, namely the outdatedness of human beings. Uh, it is also there in, in, in Hollywood uh, where he started his, and I think this is also one of the fields which has to be developed further, where he starts his uh, critique of the concept and term of progress. In the correspondence with which published in Germany 2006, under the title Schreib, mal doch, Schreib doch mal hard facts über dich, uh, we learn about an essay on progress uh, he has sent to Hannah Arendt. Uh, it was called Die Unfertigkeit des Menschen und der Begriff uh, so the unreadiness uh, of, of man and the concept of progress could be translated a bit better. Uh, it was just a sketch, uh, but what uh, Anders planned to do is to criticize the universalizing concept of progress, and he speaks about the pathology of progress, uh, which goes back to ancient philosophy and then goes further to Darwin, Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and so on. And I think this is definitely, especially in our age, where, for instance, you have alternative theories to capitalism under the term of degrowth or some others, uh, 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 a term, a concept, a project, which I think has to be uh, developed further. Because what we don't have today actually is a monograph, uh, a, a, a comprehensive work, which would be a critique of the concept of progress going back to ancient Greece through the history of philosophy to our contemporary moment. Of course, you can find parts and bits in, 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 in Walter Benjamin, for instance, or other authors, and later especially, uh, but we still don't have this kind of work. Uh, in the United States, Anders is, of course, a bit of an outsider, uh, uh, and uh, he didn't make the same kind of career as, as many others. I would say one of the reasons was, of course, that he was writing in German, not in English, and that he decided to return to Vienna in 1950, which wasn't the same Vienna as the Vienna uh, before the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy or before the start of the Second World War, which was so beautifully described by Stefan Zweig, for instance. Uh, at the time, by the way, when Günther Anders works 
in Hollywood, washing the corpses of history, as he says, namely the costumes of Romans and all other big, big civilizations and empires and so on. Uh, uh, at that time in 1942, as you know, Stefan Zweig took his life in Petropolis in Brazil, which is also interesting to see in which way these two figures actually never met in a way, but also not philosophically, uh, but instead of going into desperation, depression, taking his own life, Günther Anders, as difficult it was, and it was much more difficult than Stefan Zweig, who was part of the bourgeoisie and had a lot of money actually, helped a lot of people as well. Uh, uh, but unlike him, Günther Anders was, had a completely precarious situation. At that time, in 1945, it is the first time Günther Anders starts to deal with the nuclear age. Namely, he says, and there is an entry in his, uh, in his diaries, uh, uh, when he witnessed that act, August 1945 was the year zero of humanity. And after that point, namely that's the point when the bomb on Hiroshima was dropped, after that point, there is no coming back anymore, and what we are living in is just the end time. Uh, after that, of course, uh, uh, Günther Anders, once he returned to, to Vienna, uh, started to work uh, uh, and publish his main work, The Outdatedness of Human Beings, and also started to, to, to become politically active in something which would yet become the anti-nuclear movement. Uh, so in 1958, he travels uh, to Tokyo to a congress on, on the A-bombs and H-bombs, uh, uh, and he visits Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, which was the first time, as far as I know, that a German philosopher, maybe also the last one, I don't know, uh, uh, visited Hiroshima and Nagasaki, probably not the last time, but definitely uh, an important uh, uh, moment uh, in the history of the 20th century that a philosopher comes to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and speaks to the victims uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, this tragedy. And of course, here, here he coins his term that Hiroshima is everywhere. As I said already, uh, what, he, what, what, what he tries to prove is that it wasn't just an event which transpassed borders, it's an event which in a way transpassed uh, time itself, and it would have effects on future time, and it already has effects on our time today. Uh, one year later, when he returns mm, to Vienna, his former wife at that time, he would, she would become former later actually, but his wife at that time, uh, gives him an article of the American newspaper Newsweek, and he founds an article about the so-called Hiroshima pilot. I'm saying so-called because, of course, that wasn't the Hiroshima pilot. He found an article about a guy uh, who was flying the first plane uh, uh, before Enola Gay. Enola Gay is not just the famous song by Orchestra Maneuvers in the Dark, uh, uh, you know, the kiss which never faded away. Uh, it was also the name of the, of the plane which dropped the, the, the bomb on Hiroshima. Uh, and he found an article about Claude Ederly. Claude Ederly, a guy who was in a mental hospital at the time when Eisenhower is uh, uh, proposing, in the same way as the Soviets are, that there is a difference between peaceful and military use of uh, uh, nuclear energy. Uh, uh, Eisenhower would start atoms for peace. Uh, uh, the Soviets, as I could have seen when I visited Chernobyl two years ago, there is still this title in Cyrillic letter, of course, saying atom is the worker. It's still there. You can see the consequences, of course, of this proletariat of the, of the, the, the proletarian atom uh, in Chernobyl, but also other places. Uh, so in 1959, he decides to write a letter to Claude Oderly. So a rather unknown philosopher in Vienna writes a letter to a rather unknown figure in the United States, because Claude Ederle wasn't that popular anymore. Actually, and here we come to politics, the United States government did everything they could to silence him. Uh, uh, namely, Claude Ederle became a problem. Uh, so unlike, and why, why, why did he become so interesting to Günther Anders, morally, philosophically, and what kind of implications did he show? Unlike all the other pilots, and there wasn't just two planes, there was one plane, first plane, Claude Ederle, second plane, uh, Enola Gay. There was a third plane which was coming there after to shoot the photographs show, so that you know, the US could show that this was the end of the world, uh, the end of the war, although it was the first act of the Cold War and the beginning of the Cold War, so it wasn't an end of the world. So there were many planes, uh, 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 and uh, none of the pilots showed the same kind of guilt Claude Ederle showed. 
although Claude Ederly wasn't directly responsible. And here it becomes interesting, uh, philosophically speaking. Uh, so what happened then, one year later, after, Cla uh, after Günther Anders writes a letter to Claude Ederly, is that Claude Ederly was already in a mental institution. He writes a letter to a local senator in the United States, urging him to el eliminate the nuclear threat, claiming that the nuclear war would be the end of these people's earth. And he warned the prevention of war has become necessary 1960, if civilized, civilized life is to continue, or perhaps if any kind of life is to continue. What happened after that, many of you probably know or could, could imagine, uh, medical experts at the trial uh, uh, said that Claude Ederly is insane. Uh, he said, they said, okay, this is an intelligent, likable character, but he suffers from schizophrenia, and now wait for this, he sh suffers from a delusion that he's part of a nuclear, anti-nuclear war movement which steamed out of his guilt, out of his feeling of guilt in taking part in the bombing of Hiroshima. So basically they accuse him of being part of something which actually was in the creation already. And that's also basically the reason why they put him in a mental hospital. Because Claude Ederly had the potential, unfortunately he didn't fulfill this potential, I would say, uh, to become, as Günther Anders says, the Dreyfus affair of the 20th century. I mean, Günther Anders at one point says that the, 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 the Claude Ederly case would go down in history as the Dreyfus affair of the 20th century. Unfortunately, as we know, that wasn't the case. Uh, uh, actually, recently, a few days ago, I gave a seminar online uh, in Romania uh, uh, where my students were reading Burning Conscience, this correspondence between Anders and, and Claude Ederly, and they asked them whether they knew about Claude Ederly before reading Anders, and all of them said no. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, the same would go, for instance, if you would ask people uh, uh, about the origin of the term bikini. You know, summer is coming now, and know Slovenia has some, some sea as well, uh, 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 and uh, many people will be on the sea uh, and swimming in bikinis, but most of those people don't know the origin of, of bikini and that it's directly connected to the nuclear tests on bikini at all. And that a French engineer decided to call the bikini bikini because he wanted to make an explosion in fashion, you know, which he succeeded. It, it was a kind of, I would say, success in the semiosphere, because now, nowadays, today, no one anymore remembers the origin of the term bikini. Interestingly enough, Claude Ederly was the guy who, after Hiroshima, goes to the Pacific, to the Marshall Islands, to take part in the nuclear tests. He even flew directly into a nuclear uh, cloud. You know, so, do, so you have this situation. I mean, the guy died of cancer, of course. Uh, 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 and for Günther Anders, Claude Ederly was so important because he presented an antipode to Eichmann. Uh, because he didn't claim that he was just a cock in the machine, who just did his job, was a family man and so on. I mean, the story Hannah Arendt actually reproduced as well. Uh, uh, the banality of evil, which wasn't that ba banal as we know today. Uh, 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 Claude Ederly, unlike that, said, yes, I was a cog in the machine, and even though I didn't drop the bomb on Hiroshima, I feel guilt and I feel responsibility. And Günther Anders would, uh, uh, would uh, uh, explain this in the best way, the Claude Ederly case, in a letter he wrote to President Kennedy, uh, a letter which we don't know whether Kennedy has read or not, uh, in a letter where he says that this case is a moral scandal, and uh, defending Ederly and showing the moral and philosophical implications of his case. Uh, he says in the letter, every reasonable medical man knows this. It is abnormal to act normally during or after an abnormal situation. It is abnormal if after an appalling shock, someone goes on living as if, as if nothing happened. And even more so if a man, although the cause of the shock he underwent transcends all proportion and holding capacity of that which a human being can visualize, digest, remember, or repent, nonetheless continues behaving normally. And such is the case in question. For Ederly has left the ashes of hundreds of thousands of people and of a city which one second before had been vibrant with life behind him. If he reacted abnormally, he reacted adequately. So Gunther Anders is defending Ederly, saying that if he went crazy, or insane, that was a normal situation, you know? 
if you, after a shock, a, a war, for instance, we had a war here in ex-Yugoslavia, continue your life as if things are normal, then this is an abnormal situation. Or at one point, of course, PTSD will hit you in the, right into your face or into a face of someone else because you will go crazy. Uh, so at that time, uh, uh, and I think this is also a very prophetic text, uh, Günther Anders also uh, writes his text, uh, his parabola on Noah, uh, you know, this great mythological character, uh, uh, and this story has to be read in the background of the Cold War of the nuclear age. Uh, and I think it's a very important text because uh, 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 here he introduces this temporal shift, uh, uh, this sense of our responsibility to mourn the future. Uh, you know, the myth of Noah, of course, is not uh, new. It existed for thousands of years in different, in different civilizations, Mesopotamia, Hinduism, uh, su, 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 there, there are Sumer Sumeric texts, Chinese texts. Uh, you can find the myth of the fl flood uh, also in Hawaii, in Polynesia, and so on. Uh, I mean, in a way, you can find it in Plato, uh, uh, his allegory of Atlantis. I mean, uh, he situates Plato, Atlantis, I'm not now going into conspiracy theory, don't worry, as soon as someone mentioned Atlantis, you know, you expect them to speak about aliens and, 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 and Bill Gates chipping us as well. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that Plato situates the allegory of Atlantis 9,000 years before uh, he has written it. And this is around the time when the last glacial uh, period ends. Uh, you know, it is the time when really, according to science, uh, 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 the sea levels have risen 420 meters. So if you look down the coast of ex-Yugoslavia towards Croatia and look at Brač, Hvar, Mljet, and so on, Vis including, uh, those were not islands at that time. They were part of, of, of main, mainland. So all these myths, the myths of Noah and the myths of the flood actually were in a way an, a, a product of a real situation, of a real extinction event which happened, of a real catastrophe. And what Günther Anders is, is doing in his uh, Noah, which was originally a story which was ordered by no one else but Gudrun Enslin, uh, uh, is that uh, he makes this temporal shift and Noah speaks about uh, uh, the morning future. Uh, I don't have much, that much time, mm. and there are many things which I would love to mention, uh, but unfortunately, uh, not much time, so I will go now from Noah uh, to show in which way actually Günther Anders himself was a character similar to Noah. In which way uh, uh, this kind of prophylactic apocalypticism uh, 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 was uh, uh, the, true, the true foundation of Günther Anders' uh, philosophy but also political activism. Uh, so in his speech about the three world wars, which you can find in this book, uh, it was published in, in Hiroshima Izuberal, not published in English yet. You can find a small part on Harald Marcuse's website, uh, the grandson of, of Marcuse, whom we have to thank uh, the reception in the United States, I would say. It's still the best archive in the English language, I would say. Uh, 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 so in this text, the speech about the three world wars, uh, uh, Günther Anders himself takes the position of Noah, I would say. It was a speech which he gave at a protest in Germany, in, in the town Mainz. Uh, I think only a few days after China, or the Republic, the Communist Republic of China, uh, decided, uh, made their first nuclear test. Uh, and basically, what he does at his speech, you have to imagine Günther Anders speaking to hundreds of people in front of a protest, is that he comes and he says that we have to come together to commemorate the death of the three world wars. At that time, maybe that sounded crazy, you know, who, who speaks about three world wars. Uh, nowadays, today, I think it's not that crazy anymore. Uh, he said the problem, of course, to speak about the three world wars is that no one has this capacity to imagine the death of millions or, in fact, the death of billions. At the time of Günther Anders, 64, uh, it was around 3 billion people on planet Earth. As you know, today it's 8 billion. I think no one in this room or anywhere in any room in the world has the capacity to imagine or understand uh, the extinction of 8 billion people. And here actually Joseph Stalin, with whom I otherwise don't agree, was correct when he said that one death is a tragedy, 
one million is statistics. Uh, so if we have that in mind, I don't know whether Günther Anders had that in mind, then it poses us with a big challenge, how do we express, how do we imagine uh, 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 the mourning of this amount of people, uh, which includes us ourselves and which includes the future as well. Uh, so what, what Günther Anders does is that he says that we should try to mem remember one death, one past or one future. And perhaps the sum of those remembrances and of our sadness would approach the total sadness we are trying to remember. And perhaps we might again, we might gain the strength from all of those remembrances to ensure that the death of the future, whose deaths we are mourning in advance, might survive, that the horrible might not happen. And I'll read this part uh, 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 from, from the speech about the free world wars. Uh, because I think this is a possible, and I'm slowly coming to the end, this is a possible approach to our times today as well. Although it's not sufficient as well, because it's rather poetic, as you will see, and philosophical. Uh, he says, dear comrades living in the end of time, we have come together to commem commemorate the death of three world wars, and I think it's, there is only one way to commemorate the death of the three world wars, namely that each of us tries to commemorate one dead person, one single one. But if possible, that person shouldn't be someone you know. And he says, one person should remember an irradiated child in Hiroshima. Another should remember a burnt woman in Dresden. A third should remember a guest Jew in Auschwitz. A fourth should remember an American who drowned at sea. A fifth should remember someone beaten to death in a Gestapo cell. A seventh. Uh, a sixth should remember a martyr in Algeria. A seventh should remember a Russian frozen to ice at Stalingrad. An eighth should remember a child who will be irradiated tomorrow. A ninth should remember a sailor who will drown tomorrow. A tenth should remember a child who will not be born tomorrow. Of course, you could say this is a rather poetic approach to the possible or likable event of extinction today. Uh, but what Gunther Anders in this text, and I think that that's why also this text is a far-reaching text, introduces, and I think what is missing actually today, especially when we speak against the war or in anti-war positions, pacifist positions, is that Gunther Anders, unlike many others, doesn't shy away to talk about capitalism. Uh, you know, in this text itself, uh, 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 he says that mourning is not sufficient in a way and that uh, we have to speak about the taboo and the taboo is capitalism. He says that every child knows that capitalist production depends on selling off products uh, and uh, that it has to take care that those products are sold and used. I mean, today they don't even have to be used. It's sufficient to produce them and, and to sell them off. In short, what Günther Anders says, the goal of capitalism Capitalism is liquidation. So the, the goal, it sounds paradoxical, the goal of production is to liquidate the products, although we produce the products. And then he goes further, and I think this is something which has to be used today. Uh, uh, he applies his critique of progress to the arms industry. I mean, he applies it, of course, to the, to the weapons of mass destruction, namely nuclear weapons, and says that if there is one industry which per personificates, in a way, illustrates, but also uh, 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 exemplifies uh, uh, the, 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 the harms of the, pro of the concept of progress, it is the arms industry. Why is the arms industry? Because the point of the arms industry is constantly, through progress, to develop better and better, more intelligent weapons, and in the end, to literally liquidate them. I mean, you can find reservoir of weapons today, even here in our countries, there were a lot of weapons which were used in Afghanistan and other wars and are now, for instance, used in Ukraine, some of them. So you can see that those weapons which were not liquidated wait to be liquidated. And in the end, if we take the concept of progress seriously in the way Gunther Anders did, then the only logical step, the final conclusion, the final exit out of progress is liquidation. I mean, that's why, why, why in 79, one of, the, one of his di diary entries, Gunther Anders, for instance, says that uh, only those powers, so that's 79, only those powers who are not able yet to produce Hiroshima 
will still be satisfied to be constructing Auschwitz. And we can see this situation today. I'm not into the game of comparing genocides and mass atrocities and so on, but I must say that, you know, as many people from ex-Yugoslavia, I felt rather embarrassed, uh, uh, but also angry when I saw that when the war in Ukraine started, many political commentators, journalists, and so on were talking about the first war, war in, on European soil uh, 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 after the Second World War. While they, immediately, they, they, they somehow forgot about Srebrenica, they somehow forgot about all the atrocities which happened in ex-Yugoslavia. And here we can see that Günter Anders was right. You know, if Tuchman, Milosevic, Izetbegovic, Karadzic, Mladic, and many others war criminals from ex-Yugoslavia had the capability to have a nuclear weapon, I wouldn't have been surprised if they would have used it. And of course, they were not yet at that technological stage as Hitler was to produce Holocaust on that scale and Auschwitz and so on, but they were at the stage to produce different sorts of concentration camps on a smaller stage. But I, I said I'm not into comparing, we should never compare the figures and the numbers of, 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 of different crimes. Uh, so what is our solution? So what are the answers? I mean, there's, there's many other stuff. I didn't even touch the, 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 the view from the moon, uh, 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 which I find very, very, very potent, especially today, especially Günther Anders's point that his question, what's the use of the moon? You know, his point that uh, space exploration will end up in privatization as well, in the same way things on Earth ended up. And he also made, makes this great point about the moon, the, exp the, the landing on the moon as something which is not actually about the moon. It's something about Earth. And he introduces a term which I think today has to be used. Uh, uh, which is the term about provincialism, that you know, the landing on the moon, if it showed anything, it is not how mighty people are, but it showed the provincialism of humankind. You could have seen it a few months ago when Captain Kirk, William Shatner, returned in a capsule of Jeff Bezos uh, from space, you know, in a, in a, in a spaceship uh, from one of the richest uh, uh, persons in the world, and he returns back and he starts to talk to Jeff Bezos and tries to tell him, oh, this was this is actually, he says something in the sense of, this is an experience which I will, I will, I don't want to forget ever, something like that. And you know what Jeff Bezos does? He starts to shout, champagne, 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 and some, some of his assistants comes with champagne, he takes a big bottle of champagne and starts to, you know, uh, 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 champagne starts to flow. So who cares what Captain Kirk from Star Trek experienced uh, in, in space? So that was this, uh, uh, this provincialism. And to finally end, I just want to end by, by one point, so uh, I didn't have time to go further into it. Uh, uh, I said morning of the future is one possible strategy which we definitely need today, especially confronted with the climate crisis. Widen our sense of fantasy, widen our sense of time, and to end uh, uh, with a postscriptum to this book which was written in 1982, I think we have to remind ourselves and remember that uh, uh, we have to remain childish although, of course, they will use it against us, as always. And I think here, Günther Anders was prophetic again. He says in 1982, uh, uh, as he was finishing these, these pages, uh, uh, and a big protest was happening in Germany, he heard on the radio that a German politician was calling all the protesters childish, infantile. 1982, 40 years later, when Fridays for Future and, 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 and the huge children's movement represented by Greta Thunberg and many others started, this was the same very argument Angela Merkel, Boris Johnson, many leading politicians gave. You are infantile. And, infantile. and what Günther Anders says is the following, and I'll end with this. Ich jedenfalls bin mein Lebtag lang, I'll translate it, it take too much time. Uh, so all my life I remained infantile. I remained progra programmatic infantile. I remained so infantile that on 6th of August 1945, I became, it became impossible for me to remain in the world. I be, I'm, I'm so infantile that since 1953, I have been warning constantly about the danger. I'm so infantile that I also decided in 1958 to visit the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and to write to Ederly. As an 80 years old man, 
I remain infantile, and I hope that many people who are infantile will join ranks together. This was just a translation out of my head. Someone has to translate the full text. I'll finish here. Unfortunately, there is more things to say, but there are many other people to say more interesting and important things. Thanks a lot for the invitation, and long live Günther Anders. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ja, hvala za res odlično predavanje. Um, kak komentar, vprašanje, bolj kratko, prosim. Prosim, profesor Štrajn. Well, uh, uh, <coughs> I'm forced to have a very short question, but uh, you mentioned uh, the relationship between Walter Benjamin and uh, uh -huh. Anders. Uh, how much do you think that one thesis could be viable that they show the way uh, how to think uh, uh, through critical theory and uh, across the borders of the critical theory. As we know, the critical theory somehow uh, blocked uh, itself, especially in Horkheimer Adorno uh, um, paradigm, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, well, th th that's, that's a question. Mm -hmm. And then there is uh, also, uh, I would like to point out a small illustration when you uh, mentioned armament and so on. Uh, there was one event uh, which now is existing as a non-invent, and that was a conference on disarmament education in 1980 uh, organized uh, uh, by UNESCO. It was a world conference, mm -hmm. and then UNESCO never published proceedings. Uh, ne there was I, uh, very, very rarely anybody knows anything about that conference, and the, the only evidence about this about it is a, a very, very humble book uh, edited by Magnus Hirvels Root, uh, one of the peace uh, activists. So um, I think uh, that that's the point, you know. It is, it is well, if we talk about the link about education and, and uh, changing the world, then we have to talk about disarmament education, not peace education. <laughs> so the, just as an illustration, but uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, also thanks a lot for a wonderful uh, and very lively <laughs> presentation. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Uh, uh, I would say yes, I mean, the first question was sort of rhetorical in a way. I, I, I can see where you stand. And I would say there are, of course, similarities between uh, uh, Benjamin and Günther Anders, who were always outsiders in a way. They never got a position in the same way. They always had a precarious existence. Benjamin also had to work in various odd jobs and so on. Uh, uh, and they were friends. I mean, there is a, there, there is a beautiful entry in his diary uh, later when, when he returns to Paris and he says, uh, Günther Anders, and he says, I'm standing uh, at the window of a shop where I was standing for the last time with Benjamin, you know, and now suddenly, you know, this is a world without Benjamin. Uh, 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 so, I mean, he had a personal apocalypse as well, I would say. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, I think they went beyond critical theory, definitely. Uh, uh, it's also due to their eclecticism in a way. Uh, uh, both of them never succeeded to construct a system in a way. Günther Anders would say that he never did it because he was forced to flee from one country to another country and so on. But I actually think it's good he or Benjamin never created a system. Uh, because if they tried to create a system, maybe we wouldn't have these uh, uh, bits and parts and, and, and snapshots from the future of thoughts which still carry so much potential. Uh, so uh, your second question, the disarmament, uh, yes, I think you're completely right. Uh, especially if you look at the, at the world today, uh, where, of course, we have something which was missing in Günther Anders's time. That's what Christian Dries said. Uh, uh, climate, cri you know, climate crisis and a climate, global planetary climate movement. But what is missing today, surprisingly, is an anti-nuclear movement. Uh, and what I think we have to work on uh, 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 is to try to combine both of them. You know, an anti-war movement, anti-nuclear mo movement, and climate change movement. Uh, because what we face today is, is, is not just the nuclear age, but we have actually a collision between the nuclear age and climate catastrophe. 
uh, 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 you know, just to give one figure, uh, 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 Claude Ederly, who was flying into the mushroom cloud in Bikini, Bikini Atoll, that place from 46, he was there in 46, until 58, had 70, uh, 67, uh, I'm thinking in German for some reason, uh, 67 nuclear tests, uh, 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 which if you would count the explosive power of those bombs, uh, 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 it would be 1.6 Hiroshima bombs every day during 12 years in the Pacific Islands. No one ended up on trial, no one ended up on court, the local population is suffering, and what's happening now on Marshall Islands and atolls is that because of climate change, the sea levels are rising and they, they will, they will be disappear in the Pacific Ocean together with the nuclear waste. So what we have today is actually a situation which is even worse than at the time of Gunther Anders, in a way, if we can imagine it, in the sense that we have a collision between several eschatological threats. Climate change, nuclear uh, threat, you can add pandemic, war, whatever, and so on. But I think the nuclear threat and the climate is the most important one. And here, education, of course, uh, is crucial. So I, I, I agree. Thanks for that. Today, Srećko, hvala še enkrat.